setting aside architecture for the moment, I I just finished reading your latest book, Einstein's Unfinished Revolution. So all these years later, Einstein is still very <laughs> important to you. And what I took from that, or one of the things that I took from that is that one of your chief appreciations for Einstein was his commitment to devout realism concerning quantum mechanics. And that seems that seems like the right place to start because I've, I've read some of your other books and realism is what underpins your views on quantum mechanics, time, cosmology, probably more than I'm not listing. So I think understanding this term as you use it is where we need to begin. So Am I right that roughly you take it as your starting point that there is a mind independent world and, and this is a necessary assumption for science? Well, it's interesting. I've been thinking we have to put a separate category on realism and minds because I have been thinking about that lately. But with the, without going into rethinking panthe pantheism, the pan, panpsychism. Um, let's say yes. I take. I am a realist as far as nature is concerned, and I believe that the purpose of science is to give us the truth about nature, to give us what John Bell called us the beables. And I don't believe that quantum mechanics does that. Yeah, I, I just talked with. There's actually an episode coming out today with. Uh, our mutual friend Tim Maudlin, that is all about uh, John Bell and beables and observables and and Bell's theorem. But maybe a, a good place to start is that you write in Einstein's Unfinished Revolution that humans have always had a problem conflating reality with fantasy. So we often confuse our our stories about or descriptions of what things are like with the real thing. And these are my words here, not yours, but maybe mathematics is a good example in that many people, I think, mistake our, our quite useful talk of numbers and sets and functions as meaning that there's some real universe out there that contains just these things. But the reason I, I bring this up right off the bat is I wanted to start by asking how Fundamentally, you see the relationship between physics as a collection of stories and equations or on the one hand and then the world. Yes, well, I don't believe that there is, I'm not a Platonist. I don't believe that there is a mirror of reality which is completely expressed by some bit of mathematics, which is precisely equivalent to the universe as is. That seems to me really silly to believe that, but I did myself believe that for a long time. And a lot of people, a lot of people who do what I do or did also believe that. And I think it's a kind of fantasy. I think that's the right word for it. It's a kind of fantasy which elevates your view of what you're doing when you're doing physics work. Hmm. So much of Einstein's unfinished revolution is concerned with realism and quantum mechanics. So maybe before we turn to how a realist can make sense of quantum mechanics, what are some of the phenomena at home, at home in the microscopic that at first glance pose the biggest problems for the realist? who's accustomed to seeing the world in a classical sense? Well, the, as you hint, uh, the most difficult issues for realism have to do with violations of locality. Quantum physics is definitely not local. By local, we mean that all the forces propagate at a finite speed, and they propagate through space, and that's what causes things to happen. You don't have something happen here, and then happen here, and then happen here, and then and so forth. And I think if one restricts oneself to that kind of reality, um, one can't explain quantum mechanics, because I think that quantum mechanics violates that kind of reality, and that's what Bell's theorem tells us. Hmm. 
There are a few. So you mentioned non-locality. There's also entanglement and contextuality. Those are two other major issues that you touch on for the realist. So maybe we could talk about first what entanglement is and why that's a problem for the realist. Entanglement is the feature of the world where if you take two systems and interact them with them and then let them separate, it may be that the two of them together share some definite property which neither of them apart demonstrates any definite property concerning. So I think that's that's a good, as good as a definition of Entanglement. Um, and let me, the other one is a little bit harder to explain, so maybe can we skip it at this point and simply say that, um, what, what is it called? You just used the word. Contextuality. Contextuality is, is up to a small subtlety and application of non-locality. Hmm. And then, so given these these three features, apparent features of the quantum world, so non-locality, entanglement, and contextuality, there are a couple of early realist accounts of quantum mechanics that make sense of this. So I have in mind uh, de Broglie, but since other quote unquote interpretations of quantum mechanics have been dominant. And there, I think the main focus of your thinking in the book we've been discussing because they sort of set back developments in physics as you see it. What do you think of as uh, the most dominant of these anti-realist views? And then what, what, what is it about them that qualifies them as anti-realist? Well, the most dominant one, of course, is just incoherence. People don't think things through that they teach or read. Um, that was supposed to be funny. Um, <laughs> um, who is the most dominant? Very, a lot of people like to believe that they espouse the many worlds interpretation. Um, but well, again, uh, that's a very subtle interpretation. Like you can give it a very science fiction -y character that's not really what it says. Um, and basically, I, I think it's equivalent to a badly thought through version of Bohm's theory. But oh, really? People, people don't like to say that. Um, what it's a, what, but let's take the science fiction version, because that is the version that Bryce DeWitt, who was one of the founders of this area, espoused. That is to say, when we asked him, you don't really mean that you think it's just in a totally science fiction way. There are all these other universes out there right now. And he said, yes, that's what I mean. And then smiled. So, um, and I think that it's created a lot of problems for the theory and for science in general, because when you have a bunch of smart scientists going around saying things that are kind of silly, I think it makes the whole enterprise harder to take seriously. So I think it's, it's a problem now to make sense out of the many worlds interpretation. Um, you can't just espouse it. You have to explain how it is that when we observe the world, we see definite frames of reference. That is when we don't see the world in an arbitrarily chosen um, state or background consisting of any basis element you choose, we see the world only as, as something going on situated in a classical entity. And that requires explanation for if you're a Bohmian. Another way of saying that is that Born's rule, which is the rule that the probabilities predicted by quantum mechanics um, 
I have a certain relation to the wave function there, the absolute value squared of the wave function. And this is not a theorem of quantum mechanics. It's not an assumption either of the many worlds interpretation. So if you believe in, if you think you believe in the many worlds interpretation, you have to explain why it is that every time you make an observation, you see that precise probability proportional to the square of the wave function and not some, el some other basis ch chosen probability. And so whether you think that there is a many worlds interpretation depends on whether some quite subtle arguments given by some very smart philosophers, mostly in Oxford, have succeeded. Many Worlds has come up uh, a few times on the show so far. I recently did a, a joint episode with David Albert and Sean Carroll, where pretty much all we talked about was Many Worlds, though uh, fine-tuning and, and then Boltzmann Brains came up as well. But something they're that I got... to Yeah, yeah, they're both terrific. Uh, but something that I got a chuckle out of every time I, I saw it in your book was that you refer to many worlds as ma a view of magical realism. That's where it, it is situated in this landscape of realism and anti-realism. And I was curious about why you think of it as a form of realism, but, but magical realism. Well, first of all, I was making, I was making use of the literary. Exactly. I know. Magical, yeah. Um, I think that it's you know it's interesting because I haven't thought this through for a few months. Ago. It's the last time I had to teach this to to good students. So, and it's fairly subtle, so I don't have to think it through again. But basically, the problem is that the many worlds interpretation can be said to be that you just really remove rule one from the rule one, rule two distinction in the Copenhagen interpretation. Oh, could you say what rule one and rule two are? Yes, yes. Um, one way to present quantum mechanics, again, I think it's wrong, but it helps you get there a little bit, is to say that there are two ways that physical systems can evolve in the world. Rule one is according to the laws of nature as given by the quantum mechanics Schrodinger equation. And these states evolving under rule one never collapse. They never do anything but proceed in what we would call a unitary fashion or a linear, linear fashion. And that, of course, is not enough. That theory based on just rule one has no probabilities in it unless you think you can derive them from somewhere. And that's why it becomes a big technical issue. So most people assume that you have to add on an additional rule, which is the rule for measurement, that says that it's basically Born's rule, that the, it introduces probability into the theory by saying that if you set up suitable circumstances where you can project out of the mathematics something that you're willing to call a probability, that it will satisfy the Born rule. And when I say it that way, because um, there are many different ways you try to define a probability, and the only one that seems to not be completely wrong is the Bayesian probability, which are, of course, subjective. We could get into that when we talk about mathematics. But the probabilities that many worlds people believe they're dealing with are definitely Bayesian probabilities. And then you get people saying all sorts of weird things about self-selecting themselves and, and worse, because they, they can only allow a subjective notion of probability into the theory. So you, you might not be too unhappy after you've done enough of this kind of stuff to consider just straight, straight flat-out realism. Mm -hmm. Well, there's one last thing about 
many worlds before we move on. This was something that really surprised me about speaking with Sean and David was that I voiced what I think is the correct uh, intuitive opinion that most people have, which is that what is most absurd about, on the face of it, many worlds is that we're supposed to entertain the possibility that there's this massive number of other worlds out there that we're not in any sort of causal contact with. But they told me that this doesn't bother them at all. What bothers them is just making sense of probability. Is that something that resonates with you as well? You're not, that's not what bothers you about many worlds. It's just the probability. Well, let me make, let me make a comparison to Bohm because it's somewhat revealing here. Um, Bohm says that the wave function never collapses. Rule one is always satisfied. But there's a rule two, which is different than the other version of rule two. This version of rule two applies to particles. So we believe that waves exist on the configuration space, by the way, not in space-time. And we believe that also particles exist, and these particles satisfy equations of motion with respect to the waves that move around. Now, since you don't ever collapse the waves, and the same waves are there as any other form of quantum mechanics, in fact, Bohm has just as many ghost waves, you might call them, as anything else. The thing is that if you study how observers, which are both waves and particles, interact with the waves and particles that are, that are in the usual quantum mechanics, you'll find that there's a whole universe out there of ghost waves, and there's just as many, and they're just as ghostly. That, except that if, if you're a realist, when your system comes to make a choice or a measurement, you believe that the system consisting of the waves only goes out in its infinite number of directions, but the, but the place where the particle is located in the wave function only goes one definite place. So you've got to believe that there is if you adhere strictly to the mathematics of quantum mechanics, you've got to believe that there are an infinite number of ghost waves running around. And that's not fun either. <laughs> <laughs>